Do Jews have a system of religious law? Jewish religious law is among the most highly developed and extensive systems ever devised. This is not surprising in a tradition whose scripture begins with a large section. The Torah, for which law is the chief synonym. Ever since the end of the monarchy, Jewish communities have struggled with the problem of how to observe their own religious ordinances within the context of a larger secular or civil regime. In some circumstances the civil authorities allowed Jews considerable autonomy in administering their religious law. With the understanding that none of its provisions would run afoul of secular statutes. Legal scholars in late antiquity and through the Middle Ages produced. Voluminous collections referred to generically as the codes of law. Ancient concern with ritual purity and precision persists in some branches of Judaism. Especially among the Orthodox and many conservatives. Rabbis function as legal scholars in those situations. Interpreting the 613 specific commands and prohibitions of the Torah. For Jews less attentive to the minute details of practice, the rabbi's role is more broadly pastoral. What are the other great feasts of pilgrimage and remembrance? The Feast of Shavuot, weeks, begins seven weeks after Passover. Originally coinciding with the wheat harvest, the Feast of Weeks recalls Israel's spiritual harvest of the Divine Law at Sinai. The feast occurs on Sivan 6 the, a day longer outside Israel. The 50th day, Pentecost in Greek, after Passover, marking the end of the days of the Omer, Sheaf. In reference to the ancient practice of bringing the first sheaves of barley as temple offering. The third of the great holidays is Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles. Five days after the Day of Atonement, from Tishri 15 to 23, a day longer outside Israel except in Reform congregations. Jews celebrate this harvest festival marking the end of the vintage season. Many families construct small symbolic structures in the backyard. Recalling as they take their meals there how God sheltered the people through the wilderness of the Exodus. Along with Passover and weeks, this was a pilgrimage feast before the destruction of the temple. When many traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate. Families bless four plants as symbols of unity in diversity. Holding in the left hand a citrus called the ethrig. And in the right a bound cluster of one palm, two willow and three myrtle branches, together called the lulav. They make gestures of blessing and sing Hosanna, save us. Are there mythic elements in Jewish tradition? Many texts in the Hebrew Bible suggest associations with ancient mythic narrative. Not so much in what they discuss as in the way they express it. The paired creation stories in Genesis preserve mythic elements in their description of 
the watery chaos that existed prior to God's imposing upon it the order of a cosmos. These texts probe the mysteries of the origins of all things. Similarly blended twin accounts of destruction by a Universal flood in Genesis also hint at mythic underpinnings. The Book of Job's grand panorama of the divine work uses analogous imagery and conveys an unmistakable note of majesty and splendor. At the other end of the timeline of creation are the apocalyptic texts, in books such as Ezekiel and Daniel. For example, that describe the inevitable cataclysmic events that will herald the completion of history. To describe the biblical text as sharing important features. With myth in no way impugns or discredits the scripture. It is merely a way of characterizing how the Hebrew Bible communicates in several key accounts. How do Jews view Judaism's relationships to other traditions? Even the earliest biblical texts that describe the formative years of Judaism as a faith tradition show a vivid, if largely disapproving, awareness of the religious practices and beliefs of other peoples. Jews were to be a people of faith who would distinguish themselves by their faithful response to divine initiative. Biblical Judaism defined itself in the context of various Canaanite pagan cults, which often exercised an unholy fascination on Jews of wavering faith. Most Jews are, of course, keenly aware of their tradition's complex relationship to Christianity, which claims to be a fulfillment of an ancient messianic expectation. From the Jewish perspective, Christianity was just another of many false movements of its kind. Many have also been puzzled and hurt by ongoing Christian condemnations of Jews as Christ killers. A hateful epithet only recently repudiated by the Pope. Throughout medieval times in Europe, Jews often suffered cruelly as a result of severely prejudicial Christian decrees as to how Jews should live and even what they should wear in public. Most of all, many Jews simply do not understand why so many. Christians have harbored such a virulent animosity toward Jews. Judaism has also had an important connection to Islam over the centuries. Jews have generally fared better under Muslim regimes throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and Spain than under Christian authority. From a strictly religious perspective, however, Judaism is strikingly close to Islam in many respects, both in practice and belief. From an uncompromising monotheism to dietary concerns to an egalitarian style of worship and view of authority. Are any other regular observances significant in the Jewish ritual year? Three days of fasting and mourning, two in summer and one in winter, are connected to remembrance of the first and second temples. Tesha B.A.V., the ninth of A.V., is a day of lamentation for the destruction of Solomon's temple in 586 BCE. 
Israeli Jews and pilgrims gather at the western wall of the Herodian temple to grieve over the loss. The short biblical book called Lamentations is a traditional reading for the occasion. Associated rituals have given the remains of the temple the popular name the Wailing Wall. Eight days after Hanukkah, on the 10th of Tevez. Another fast commemorates the Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar's initial siege of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. In more recent times the occasion has become associated with mourning for victims of the Holocaust. On the 17th of Tammuz. A less popular occasion, some Jews fast to recall the times when the armies of Nebuchadnezzar and Titus first broke through the walls of the temple in 587-6 BCE and 70 CE, respectively. Finally, there are two other minor observances. One is the 15th of Shabbat, the new year for trees, Rosh Hashanah Eli Ilanot. A day of thanks to God for the bounty of the earth. The other is called Sinchat Torah, rejoicing in the Torah. The day after the Feast of Booths, Jews celebrate the end of the annual cycle of liturgical readings. With processions in which the scrolls are carried around the synagogue with children leading the crowd. What does the term revelation mean in Jewish tradition? Multiple descriptions of revelation appear in the Hebrew scriptures. Earlier books depict a strikingly direct relationship between individual people and the Creator. Beginning with Adam and Eve and continuing through the stories of the great patriarchs. We hear of God's forthright communication and self-disclosure. God is depicted as dealing directly with Noah and Abraham. Moses' encounter with the Divine Presence at the burning bush and on M.T. Sinai are definitive events in the unfolding revelation. The tone and manner of revelation changes somewhat in the historical chronicles of the various kings. See especially I and 2 Samuel. I and two kings, for visions were rare in those days. The sources suggest that God now reveals less through fantastic events and more through the agency. Of prophets sent to deliver a message, beginning with the court prophets of the early monarchy. Now the prophets hear the divine word not in storm or earthquake or fire but in a still small voice, I Kings 19,9-12. When the great writing prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, deliver the message, they simply preface it with the words thus says the Lord. Even there, God appears as one who speaks clearly and intimately with select individuals. The Hebrew scriptures are as rich in this kind of imagery as any sacred text on earth. But the most important issue here is not the imagery with which the scripture describes divine self-disclosure, but the content of the message. Revelation runs the gamut from sanction to solace, from unquenchable wrath to unfathomable mercy. Do Jews practice rituals of divination? In biblical times one of the roles of the temple's high priest was to serve as a medium for oracles. 
Part of the priestly paraphernalia was a mysterious pair of objects called the Urim and Thummim, which were a form of lot carried in a pocket called the breastplate and suspended from the shoulders. The Urim and Thummim, a pair of flat stones, are mentioned a number of times in the Hebrew Bible. Suggesting that this form of divination was of some importance, even though others were explicitly forbidden. Thummim may derive from a word that meant perfect, hence of positive value. Scholars surmise that Urim probably carried a negative meaning. They may thus have been read as yes or no, guilty or innocent. For example, in determining the answer to a question. Even the word Torah apparently comes from a root that means to cast lots in order to obtain an oracle. The high priest would toss the Urim and Thummim, one meaning yes and the other no. In order to determine God's will in a given instance. King Saul was so chosen to rule Israel, as were priests in outlying areas selected to work in the temple. Divination has found no significant place in post-biblical Jewish tradition. What are the High Holy Days? The autumnal holy days begin with Rosh Hashanah, beginning of the year. On the first and second days of Tishri, ushered in with the sound of the ram's horn. Shofar, as a symbol of divine sovereignty over the universe. This begins a period in which people make an accounting. Of how they have cared for creation entrusted to them. On the third day of Tishri comes the fast of Gedaliah, Tsum Gedaliah, on which Jews recall the end of the first Jewish commonwealth, 2 Kings 25,25. But the culmination of the period occurs on the tenth day of Tishri in a major fast observing the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. This day features five worship services and includes a communal confession. On the evening before, a cantor prays the very moving Kol Nidriyi, all the vows, which annuls all rashly made promises of the previous year. Emphasis is on forgiveness of all wrongdoing. Regular morning prayer begins the next day followed by additional prayers later in. The morning focused specially on this feast. Afternoon prayer is followed by a service that recalls the closing of the temple gate in olden days and includes the Amida. A litany called Our Father, Our King, the Shema, and a concluding sound of the ram's horn. The five services virtually flow from one to the next, making for a very full day of prayer. Are doctrine and dogma important to Jews? Jewish tradition is generally more concerned with orthopraxy, correct practice, than with orthodoxy, correct opinion. Creedal statements such as the 13 articles offer a convenient distillation of the heart of Jewish belief. But there have been few historical instances of prominent attempts to use adherence to a body of doctrine as a measure of membership. Even now, 
with ultra-Orthodox groups in Israel pressing the question of who has the right to call him or herself a Jew. The issue turns more on behavior than on belief. The most conservative elements claim that only religiously engaged Jews are truly Jews. But practical adherence to the Halakha is the crux of the matter. There have been no major cases of Jewish inquisitions targeting false teachings. What is a scapegoat? We use the term scapegoating to refer to any attempt to shift blame onto some person or group in order to escape consequences for oneself. In religious studies the term applies to the ritual transference of guilt or evil intent. And it implies that those affecting the transfer are aware of their complicity in the performance or furtherance of some evil act or condition. Chapter 16 of the Book of Leviticus describes perhaps the best known example of the ritual use of a scapegoat. God instructs Moses as to how his brother, Aaron the priest, is to perform the ritual of atonement for sin. He must take two goats and cast lots to decide which will be sacrificed. After sacrificing the one, he must lay his hands on the live goat. Confess all the people's sins upon the animal's head, and send the goat out into the wilderness. Through this ritual transferal the guilt of the whole community, once acknowledged, is purified from its midst. Ironically, Jews themselves have often been the victims of a more tragic scapegoating through history. Scapegoating now typically involves projection of evil and ill intent onto a hapless but convenient other. Sad confirmation of the adage that we hate most in others the very things we cannot face in ourselves. Is there a central teaching or legislative authority for Jews? During later biblical times, beginning around 200 BCE, a principal deliberative body of 71 members, called the Sanhedrin, Greek signed Ryan, handled all religious and secular matters of importance to Jewish life. Originally located in the Jerusalem Temple, the Sanhedrin remained active until around 425 CE. Membership consisted of three groups, at least during New Testament times. The elders who represented the major tribal clans and families, the high priests. Including elders of the four priestly families as well as former high priests, and the scribes. Religious legal scholars belonging mostly to the sect known as the Pharisees. The high priest, or Nasi, was chosen from descendants of Moses' brother Aaron and governed the council. While the Sanhedrin did function as a court of law in exceptional cases. It was concerned mostly with larger administrative and juridical issues. Meanwhile, the Bet Din, literally, House of Judgment, generally adjudicated legal questions. Including both religious and civil matters affecting the Jewish community exclusively. Roman law allowed for a large measure of internal rule among Jewish subjects. The Bet Din required at least three male 
judges but handled criminal cases with as many as 23 judges. The class of religious scholars known as the five peers of teachers bore special responsibility for the two legal bodies. Hillel, Nasai, and Shammai, A.V. Betdin, Chief Justice of the Court, were the last of the peers. In this separation of civil and religious spheres, the high priest generally retained final authority. Though the Sanhedrin did not survive into late antiquity, the Bet Din remained vital through the Middle Ages and still functions as arbiter of personal status law for Israeli Jews, with the chief rabbi presiding during later antiquity. C500-1000, the scholarly class called the Janim, eminences, functioned as a major authority for Middle Eastern and European Jews by publishing their rulings in documents called responsa. For Jewish communities in Iraq, land of the exile, the position of exilarch. Resh Galuta, head of those in exile, generally occupied by laymen. Continued to wield some authority until about the mid-13th century. For many generations, even up to early modern times, the Kehila or local Jewish community organization, was the principal decision-making body. What happens when a non-Jew wishes to convert to Judaism? Prospective converts who present themselves with appropriate motivation for the change undergo a period of special instruction in the faith and its main practices. They meet regularly with a rabbi or learned layperson to discuss key texts of scripture and major features of tradition. The precise details of instruction may vary somewhat from one branch of Judaism to another. But in general the emphasis is on the religious obligations the convert is about to accept. Candidates then have a brief examination before the modern-day equivalent of the ancient House of Judgment. Bet Din, usually three people active in the faith, including but not limited to rabbis. A ceremonial purifying bath in a pool called a mikveh comes next. Men must be circumcised, and those already circumcised go through a ceremony. Called circumcision for drawing blood to remove only a token drop of blood. Finally, the convert is welcomed into the community of believers. What gender-related issues are important for religious Jews? Concern for ritual purity has occupied a central place in much of Jewish tradition. Beginning with the Torah's laws of holiness and continuing in the observance of the stricter branches of Judaism. Matters related to female fertility, menstruation, and childbearing, for example, have received a great deal of attention. According to scripture, menstruation renders a woman ritually unclean. As does the birth of a child, for seven days if a boy, fourteen if a girl. Gender has had significant implications in religious as well as social roles. Especially in orthodox and conservative communities. 
In modern times the question of whether women should become rabbis has arisen. Reform and Reconstructionist communities do have increasing numbers of female rabbis. And the conservative Jewish Theological Seminary of America began accepting female candidates not long ago. Orthodox communities still sponsor only men as candidates for the rabbinate. What are some of the main varieties of Jewish religious officials or specialists? During biblical times the centralized cult of the temple in Jerusalem required a large and elaborate system of specialists and functionaries. Special roles were assigned to tribes, and to certain clans and families within the tribes. Destruction of the second temple in 70 CE brought dramatic change in its wake. Including a great simplification in ritual practice. The shift to local synagogue worship naturally required the development of a local officialdom whose duties would include presiding over much smaller scale ritual and, at the same time, looking after the more comprehensive spiritual needs of a local community for whom the synagogue was now the focus of religious life. The rabbi, Hebrew for my master, is the principal religious authority and community. Representative in contemporary Judaism as well as the primary leader of synagogue worship. The latter function seems to be a relatively modern development. With emphasis in earlier post-biblical eras on the rabbi as scholar and teacher. In some regions, rabbinical conferences or other organizations may elect or appoint one of their members to serve as chief rabbi. Most synagogues and local communities divide duties among several other offices. One of the more important is that of the cantor, Hazan. Often a person of considerable musical ability and training whose duty is to chant sacred text and to sing special prayers for the various religious observances. The position has been especially necessary in communities whose members generally do not read Hebrew. In late antiquity the term Hazan referred to several community functions. But later it was applied exclusively to the cantor, Shalayaksabur. Throughout Jewish history, many rabbis have served as cantors in their synagogues. But rabbi cantors are now less common. In some congregations a layperson called the gabe, overseer, roughly, has the duty of commissioning Torah readers for each service. What do Jews believe about God? God is both utterly transcendent and strikingly accessible, both awe-commanding and irresistible. As the ultimate majestic power, the merest hint of divine nearness brings all creation to its knees. This God is the Holy One of Israel into whose presence only a fool would enter nonchalantly. Any person of sense knows instinctively that to approach God is to be filled with dread. That's what holy means forbidden, off limits. Holy other. Dread is not always a bad thing. Here it is clearly an appropriate response.
This does not mean that God is cruel or despotic. Although some scriptural accounts might seem to convey that impression. Recall the story of the men assigned to carry the Ark of the Covenant to its new abode. When their ox stumbled, one man lunged for the Ark to keep. It from slipping from the cart and was instantly struck dead. The point of the story is that God means danger. And when God claims allegiance, there is no room for the tentative. Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. Israel's kings and military commanders were ordered to commit total war. Sparing nothing, so jealous was God for complete dedication. At the same time Jewish images of God convey a divine intimacy and immediacy. God creates all things by the unimaginable power of divine speech. Every divine word is immediately embodied in some undeniable event. God walks with Adam in the cool of the evening and delivers. Through the prophets a message of absolute tenderness. Most of all, the God of the Hebrew Bible is unfailingly devoted to his people. This God acts in all the events of human history. How and where do members of local Jewish communities come together? The synagogue, from the Greek for coming together, sometimes referred to as the temple, is the principal venue of Jewish community life. More traditional synagogues have served very localized communities. Especially for Jews who choose to observe Sabbath restrictions on the use of motor vehicles and prefer to walk to worship. It is more usual nowadays for reform synagogues especially to draw members from much greater distances. Shifting their scope from neighborhood to wider metropolitan area or even broader region. Many synagogues, especially those serving wealthier communities, are parts of extensive complexes. Some include libraries, auditoriums for plays and concerts, and even art galleries, in addition to worship space. Some with both larger and smaller spaces, staff offices, and facilities for social functions. What kinds of rituals do Jews engage in privately or alone? Home remains the principal place for Jewish prayer and religious observance. Traditional prayer includes the thrice daily Amidah, standing, prayer in morning, afternoon, and evening. The morning and evening prayers begin with benedictions that praise God's love of Israel as manifested in the creation of light and in the ordering of day and night. The Shema follows, acknowledging the one God's redemption of the people. At the center of all three prayers is the Shimon Esra, or 18 blessings. Prayer ends with the Elenu. Upon us praise is incumbent. Afternoon prayer usually. Add Psalm 145. According to the Talmud, all Jews should pray a hundred benedictions. Birakhat, every day, in recognition of all things enjoyable, to give thanks. And prior to all other religious duties, in addition to the blessings that are part of daily prayers.
How and when do Jews celebrate Passover, Pesach? Celebrated Nisan 15 to 22, a day longer outside of Israel, Passover, Pesach. Is a spring festival commemorating God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt. The rebirth of nature recalls the birth of Israel as a people. Specifically its imagery derives from the belief that God instructed the Israelites to mark their doorposts with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. When God sent an angel to strike dead the firstborn of all the Egyptians. The angel would pass over the houses of the Israelites. The biblical account appears in Exodus 11-12. During the observance of the Passover Seder. Order of Service, participants recount the story in the Haggadah Shel Pesach. Celebrating with unleavened bread and wine. Participants begin by blessing the, the wine and washing their hands. They then dip a vegetable into salt water and eat it, recalling the Red Sea. They then break the second of three pieces of bread, maza, and hide it for the children to search out later in recollection of hunger and divine manna in the desert. After recounting the story of the Exodus, they drink a second cup of wine and wash their hands again. Blessing the bread, they eat the first piece and what remains of the second piece. They eat some bitter herbs, recalling the suffering of the slaves in Egypt, then dip some herbs into Cherozet. A paste of spices, wine, maza, and fruit, symbolizing the mortar the former slaves made for Pharaoh. The main meal is followed by eating the hidden part of the second maza, and by a final blessing and a third cup of wine. The celebration closes with a psalm of praise and another cup of wine. If not, how can one say that God is just? Sheol becomes identified more as recompense for an evil life. But is gradually replaced by the concept of Gehenna. Just south of Jerusalem lies a small valley that may at one time have belonged to a man named Hinnom. Hence G.E. Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. It must have been a most unpleasant place. Long-standing tradition associates it with fiery punishment. Possibly because it had been a place for incinerating refuse in ancient times. As a parallel to this abode of deserved misery there must surely be a place where the good are rewarded. Perhaps near the dwelling of God himself. Generic notions of the heavens as a place above earth appear very early in biblical thought. Gradual spiritualization of the idea of heaven went along with the notion that there are multiple levels the third of which is a paradise for the just. All of this is linked to the idea of resurrection of the body. Taught by the Pharisees and accepted as a rule in post-biblical rabbinical tradition. How do Jews conduct their regular communal liturgical worship? A feature of ritual practice common to all Jewish congregations is the reading of scripture. 
ancient Palestinian custom used a cycle in which Sabbath. Readings completed the whole Torah in a three-year cycle. Some reform and conservative communities have reinstituted that practice in recent times. Orthodox and Reconstructionist congregations continue to use the ancient Babylonian custom of a one-year cycle of 54 Siddharim. On Mondays, Thursdays, and Sabbath mornings and afternoons. As well as on new moons and special religious festivals, Jews read Torah in the synagogue. Regular Sabbath readings follow the Torah in order, continuously, from Genesis through Deuteronomy. Readings for the various feasts and fasts are chosen. Specially for the occasion and do not follow a continuous cycle. In addition, texts from the former and latter prophets, but not from the writings, are selected as a kind of parallel or commentary on the day's Torah texts. These supplementary readings, used on Sabbaths, fasts, and feasts, are called Haftara. Some theorize that the practice of parallel readings originated during Seleucid times when persecution included a ban on Torah reading. Communal prayer adds to the regular prayers of the privately performed Amida the Kadusha, Triple Holy. At the end of the third benediction in morning and afternoon, as well as the Kaddish. Holy in Aramaic, to mark the end of the various segments of the communal prayer and to bring it to a close. The standard prayer book for synagogue worship is called the Siddur. Order, which is based on the Psalter. The first formal edition dates back to about the 9th century CE. What are Kanaka and Purim? An observance perhaps best known to non-Jews is the late autumn feast of dedication called Hanukkah. Which begins on Kislev 25 and continues for 8 days. The nine-branch candlestick recalls how, during the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid profanation of the temple, a one-day supply of oil miraculously lasted all eight days of the rededication of the holy place. Each evening families light an additional candle from the central flame, sing devotional songs, and exchange small presents. Another remembrance of a similar Jewish victory against great odds is the Feast of Purim. A month before Passover, after a day-long preparatory fast. The Feast of Lots on the 14th of Adar commemorates how the evil Persian Haman tried to wipe Israel out by casting lots. The Book of Esther, one of the five Megillot tells the story of one of Judaism's most redoubtable heroines. The day before Purim recalls the fast of Esther, Tanit Esther, and the day after, called Shushan Purim. Observes the memory of how Esther's deeds gave cause for joy among the Jews of Shushan. Purim has an almost carnival atmosphere, complete with costumes and the giving of gifts. What is a minion? When Jews gather for worship they need a minimum number in attendance, or quorum. 
Orthodox tradition excludes women from being counted toward. The minimum of 10 members over 13 years of age. But both Reformed and Conservative traditions have in recent times voted to count women in the minion. The accommodation presupposes that women in the local community have passed their bat mitzvah. A rite of passage not open to Orthodox women. The notion of a religious quorum seems to rest on a fairly clear distinction between private and public worship. Since public or communal worship is of a different order than private worship, tradition draws a clear line between them. So when there are not enough people to form a minion, Everyone returns home or prays privately in the synagogue. What kind of religious calendar do Jews observe? The Jewish liturgical calendar combines elements of both lunar and solar reckoning. Lunar months are 29 or 30 days long, and the first month of the year is that in which the exodus began. But tradition dictates that certain feasts must occur during certain seasons. So the calendar has to be adjusted every so often to prevent the lunar months from straying too far from the agricultural, or solar, cycle. To make it work, an extra month, called a darshini, second Adar, is added during seven out of every 19 years. The Jewish lunar months are called Tishri, September slash October, Cheshvan, October slash November, Kislov, November slash December, Teves, December slash January, Shavat, January slash February, Adar, February slash March. Adar Shini, second Adar, inserted only in leap years, Nisan, March slash April, Iyar. April slash May, Sivan, May slash June, Tammuz, June slash July, Av, July slash August, and Elul, August slash September. With the leap year provision, the lunar month slide back or forward but remain within the solar months indicated in parentheses. What did the Jewish state declared on May 14, 1948? In the 1930s the world's Jews could see that the survival of European Jews depended on mass immigration to Palestine and to friendly states. This humanitarian imperative, however, was rejected by Britain and by those countries. Like the United States, where Jews might conceivably have found a home. Faced with Hitler's hatred on the one hand, and world indifference on the other. The world's Jews realized the absolute need for a Jewish homeland. A sovereign state where Judaism was not only a religion, but a nationality. With the proclamation of an independent Jewish state on May 14, 1948. For the first time since the destruction of the temple and the dispersion of the Jews. Jewishness became a national as well as a religious identity. By the law of return every Jew had a right to Israeli citizenship. 
Thus the state of Israel had become a solution to the problem of the Jews. Whose history since the dispersion had been one of trauma and tragedy. In medieval England the Jews had been expelled, in 15th century Spain they had endured the same fate. In most cases, Jews could not achieve political equality in the lands where they settled. And they lacked a land they could call their own and to which they could return. The proclamation of an independent Israel was the signal for a combined attack by the Arab states. After initial setbacks and mixed success. The Israelis were able to create a national army and to arm it, to an extent, with modern weapons. As a result of these efforts, the tide of battle gradually turned, and, by the end of 1948, Israeli forces led a campaign through southern Palestine and even into Egypt itself. In a later thrust, an Israeli column drove down to the Red Sea, securing the port of Eilat. During one of several ceasefires, Count Folke Bernadotte A.F. Wisborg, the United Nations mediator, was assassinated by Zionist terrorists. Finally, by July, 1949, armistice agreements were signed with the Arab states. What do Jews call God? Various important terms appear through the Hebrew Bible. Torah uses the words Elohim, a kind of plural form related to the same Semitic root. El, from which the Islamic name for God, Allah, derives. But the word Yahweh is a still more central term. Sometimes translated as he who is, in connection with God's identifying himself to Moses. Through the burning bush as I am who am or I will be who I will be, a high Asher a high. Many Jews choose not to pronounce this most sacred name of God. When reading scripture they prefer to substitute the Hebrew Hashem. The name, every time the word Yahweh appears. Similarly, many Jewish publications in English print simply GD in place of God. Out of reverence for the sacred word. Another term, Adonai, my Lord, is also significant here. Some people combine the vowels from Adonai with the consonants of Yahweh to get Jehovah. This linguistic compromise allows people to both say and not say the sacred name of God. Do Jewish communities practice excommunication or banishment for religious reasons? Concern for purity led to the expulsion of lepers, those impure because of contact with the dead. And those suffering from a discharge of bodily fluids. From the camp of the Israelites as described in Book of Numbers 5 4. Lepers especially were considered not only unhealthy but ritually and ethically unclean, due to the prevalent belief that such an affliction implied some moral guilt on the part of either the individual or the leper's parents. Elsewhere in the Hebrew scripture we hear of the practice of her M. Placing a ban on certain things, such as the spoils of war or the results of ritual sacrifice. In biblical usage, 
to ban an item was to dedicate it totally to the Lord. Later Jewish tradition used the term harem to apply to a kind of excommunication. When authenticated instances of heretical views came to the attention of rabbinical authorities, they could banish the culprit from the community. The philosopher Baruch Spinoza, 1632-1677, for example, was excommunicated from the Sephardic community for his insistence on the primacy of reason and for views judged to be pantheistic. Earlier a Portuguese Jew named Uriel de Costa, 1585-1640 underwent formal excommunication twice and endured public humiliation for his unacceptable views. Some interpret both Spinoza and de Costa as examples of a clash between Enlightenment views and traditional Jewish beliefs. What is meant by the term covenant? Covenant, Birith in Hebrew, describes better than perhaps any other. Single notion the essential quality of God's relationship to humankind. Discussion of divine initiatives that result in the sealing of a covenantal. Bond appears early in the Torah and continues through the prophetic books. Covenants were a crucial social cement in many ancient Near Eastern societies, including Israel. Partners in a covenant need not be equal in status and power. Many covenants described between human partners in the Bible are between a lord or ruler and his vassals. A more or less common formula for these lord-vassal relationships evolved. This covenant treaty form typically began with a section in which the lord names himself in relation to the vassal or subject. A brief historical summary recalls all the good things the lord has provided. That is followed by a list of blessings that will accrue to the subject who is faithful. And the curses that will befall one who is lax or breaks the covenant. Some elements of the treaty form, as well as of the treaty lawsuit the Lord might. Bring against one who violated the agreement, appear here and there in the Hebrew Bible. Accounts of major covenants between God and his people include those with Noah, Genesis 6 and 9. Marked by the appearance of the rainbow and the cessation of destruction by flood, Abraham, Genesis 15 to 17. Sealed by the sign of circumcision, and Moses at Sinai, Exodus 19 to 24, embodied in the revealed law. At various points in the historical and prophetic books we hear of covenant renewals. A leader, such as Joshua, calls the people to account for their past behavior and challenges them to reaffirm their allegiance to God, the Sovereign. Joshua 24 is a fascinating example of how some elements of the Ancient treaty formula apparently survived in the practice of Israel. King David's rule is also marked by a covenant renewal led by the court prophet Nathan, 2 Samuel 7. Prophets, such as Jeremiah, spiritualize the notion of covenant. Saying that God wishes to inscribe the special relationship on the tablets of their hearts, Jeremiah 33.
What are the Ten Commandments? Also known as the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments as they are most widely known from Exodus 20. 1 to 17 are actually an abbreviated version of the law revealed to Moses at Sinai. The first three concern Israel's relationship to God. They forbid idolatry the worship of gods other than God along with making images of God. And prohibit taking the name of God in vain. Believers are commanded to keep the Sabbath holy as God did after the labor of creation. Commandments 4 through 10 have to do with proper behavior toward fellow human beings. They begin with the need to honor one's parents. They then enjoin against a series of five evils, murder, adultery, theft, lying and defaming another and coveting anything that belongs to a neighbor, including members of his family. The Decalogue is followed by scores of more specific regulations concerning every conceivable area of ordinary life that further interpret the details implied in the Ten Commandments. Thus the Ten function as a kind of minimum ethical standard. Following them carefully even in a general way is challenging enough. But to observe them in the full detail given in scripture is another matter altogether. What is the significance of keeping kosher? Kashrut is the Hebrew term for the use of ritually pure, kasher, food. It refers to the way food is prepared as well as to certain types of food. With respect to manner of preparation, the opposite of kasher is tirfa. Torn by a predator, rather than properly butchered. The basic principle here is that an animal's death by predator constitutes a defect in the animal product. Proper butchering, called shihita, involves using only perfectly smooth blades to slit the animal's throat and windpipe, draining the blood, and inspecting for blemishes. With respect to types of food, Jews make a number of major distinctions between what is clean and what is unclean. Clean animals include cattle, sheep, and other ruminants with fully cloven hooves. But not non-ruminant mammals or those with solid or only partly cloven hooves, such as dogs or horses. Clean birds include pigeons, doves, chickens, pheasant, and domestically raised geese and ducks but not birds of prey, wild waterfowl, or most other common wild birds. All reptiles and amphibians are unclean, but fish with scales and internal bones. As opposed to cartilage, as with shark, are acceptable. In addition, expanding on the biblical prohibition of cooking a kid in its mother's milk, Exodus 34 26, dairy and meat products may not be combined in any way. Strict observers of Kashrut keep separate sets of kitchen tools some. Even totally separate kitchens for meats and dairy products. Kosher practice is an excellent example of the distinction between custom and ritual. Observance of dietary laws often involves, or presupposes, precise ritual action. 
such as in the kosher method of slaughtering an animal or the care taken not to contaminate utensils. But in general it means simply a customary way of handling food that has religious implications. What is the significance of keeping kosher? Kashrut is the Hebrew term for the use of ritually pure, kasher, food. It refers to the way food is prepared as well as to certain types of food. With respect to manner of preparation, the opposite of kasher is tirfa. Torn by a predator, rather than properly butchered. The basic principle here is that an animal's death by predator constitutes a defect in the animal product. Proper butchering, called shihita, involves using only perfectly smooth blades to slit the animal's throat and windpipe draining the blood, and inspecting for blemishes. With respect to types of food, Jews make a number of major distinctions between what is clean and what is unclean. Clean animals include cattle, sheep, and other ruminants with fully cloven hooves, but not non-ruminant mammals or those with solid or only partly cloven hooves, such as dogs or horses. Clean birds include pigeons, doves, chickens, pheasant, and domestically raised geese and ducks. But not birds of prey, wild waterfowl, or most other common wild birds. All reptiles and amphibians are unclean, but fish with scales and internal bones. As opposed to cartilage, as with shark, are acceptable. In addition, expanding on the biblical prohibition of cooking a kid in its mother's milk. Exodus 34 26 Dairy and meat products may not be combined in any way. Strict observers of Kashrut keep separate sets of kitchen tools, some even totally separate kitchens for meats and dairy products. Kosher practice is an excellent example of the distinction between custom and ritual. Observance of dietary laws often involves, or presupposes, precise ritual action. Such as in the kosher method of slaughtering an animal or the care taken not to contaminate utensils. But in general it means simply a customary way of handling food that has religious implications. What are the principal Jewish rites of passage? Circumcision, giving a name and redemption of the firstborn son are important early rites. To welcome older youngsters into full membership in the community. The most prominent rites are puberty or coming of age rituals. At that time a young boy becomes a son of the commandment, bar mitzvah. In a similar ritual a young girl becomes a daughter of the commandment. Bat mitzvah, except in the Orthodox tradition. Confirmation still often acknowledges an older teenager's full maturity. Marriage rites continue to be important traditional practices. As do specific rites of departure from this life. What are the principal Jewish rites of passage?
circumcision, giving a name, and redemption of the firstborn son are important early rites. To welcome older youngsters into full membership in the community. The most prominent rites are puberty or coming of age rituals. At that time a young boy becomes a son of the commandment, bar mitzvah. In a similar ritual a young girl becomes a daughter of the commandment. Bat mitzvah, except in the orthodox tradition. Confirmation still often acknowledges an older teenager's full maturity. Marriage rites continue to be important traditional practices. As do specific rites of departure from this life. How do Jews celebrate birth? When God made a covenant with Abraham, Genesis 17. The removal of the foreskin of the penis was to be the sign of its ratification. Circumcision of baby boys generally occurs on the eighth day. Performed by a specialist called a mohel, who is often a rabbi, in the baby's home. After the surgical procedure and accompanying prayers are completed, participants bless a cup of wine. Parents then declare the child's name. Reform communities now have a parallel home ritual to welcome baby girls, including all but the surgery. Other congregations still generally perform the naming ritual for girls in the synagogue. Some still give children two names, one religious, in Hebrew or Yiddish, and one secular. In addition to these early rituals, a ritual of redemption of a firstborn son also occurs on the 31st day of his life. The practice arose from the biblical teaching that each firstborn Son belongs to God but can be bought back, Numbers 18,15-16. In general the ritual is tied to the residual importance of the hereditary priesthood. For it requires a Kohen, or descendant of the biblical priesthood, to perform it. How do Jews celebrate birth? When God made a covenant with Abraham, Genesis 17. The removal of the foreskin of the penis was to be the sign of its ratification. Circumcision of baby boys generally occurs on the eighth day. Performed by a specialist called a mohel, who is often a rabbi, in the baby's home. After the surgical procedure and accompanying prayers are completed, participants bless a cup of wine. Parents then declare the child's name. Reform communities now have a parallel home ritual to welcome baby girls, including all but the surgery. Other congregations still generally perform the naming ritual for girls in the synagogue. Some still give children two names, one religious, in Hebrew or Yiddish, and one secular. In addition to these early rituals, a ritual of redemption of a firstborn son also occurs on the 31st day of his life. The practice arose from the biblical teaching that each firstborn son belongs to God but can be bought back, Numbers 18 15-16.
In general the ritual is tied to the residual importance of the hereditary priesthood. For it requires a Kohen, or descendant of the biblical priesthood, to perform it. What happens at a Jewish initiation, bar slash bat mitzvah, ceremony? Jewish boys of 13 and girls of 12 are formally recognized as religiously mature. They become sons and daughters of the commandment, bar or bat mitzvah. In rituals that acknowledge that they are now responsible for fulfilling the prescriptions of the divine law. Most communities, other than the Orthodox. Celebrate this coming of age for both genders publicly in the synagogue. A central feature of the ritual involves the initiate's reading from the Torah scroll in Hebrew. Other features can extend to a much broader participation in the service. Including carrying the scroll to the reading table and reciting other prayers. In some communities, a joint confirmation ceremony for 16 or 17 year old boys and girls occurs in conjunction with the Feast of Weeks, since that observance commemorates the original reception of the Torah at Sinai. Confirmation replaced the puberty rite in some European communities. Now some reform, conservative and Reconstructionist congregations practice both confirmation and bar-slash-bat mitzvah. What happens at a Jewish initiation, bar-slash-bat mitzvah, ceremony? Jewish boys of 13 and girls of 12 are formally recognized as religiously mature. They become sons and daughters of the commandment, bar or bat mitzvah. In rituals that acknowledge that they are now responsible for fulfilling the prescriptions of the divine law. Most communities, other than the Orthodox. Celebrate this coming of age for both genders publicly in the synagogue. A central feature of the ritual involves the initiate's reading from the Torah scroll in Hebrew. Other features can extend to a much broader participation in the service. Including carrying the scroll to the reading table and reciting other prayers. In some communities, a joint confirmation ceremony for 16 or 17 year old boys and girls occurs in conjunction with the Feast of Weeks, since that observance commemorates the original reception of the Torah at Sinai. Confirmation replaced the puberty rite in some European communities. Now some reform, conservative and Reconstructionist congregations practice both confirmation and bar-slash-bat mitzvah. What is the ritual details of circumcision? Circumcision the removal of the foreskin of the penis is performed. On all male Jewish children on the eighth day after their birth. It is also performed on male converts to Judaism. The operation is called for in Genesis 17 and is considered. The strongest required sign of adherence to Judaism. 
it is also a powerful symbol of the covenant of Abraham. As implied by the Talmudic tractate Netarim 31b. Circumcision was originally performed because the foreskin was considered to be a blemish. To attain a state of perfection, the foreskin had to be removed. During ancient times, some Hellenistic Jews especially those whose loins would be exposed in the course of athletics or public bathing had an operation performed to conceal their circumcisions. Later, in order to prevent Jewish men from hiding their circumcisions, rabbis added the requirement that the entire force can not just the end portion be excised completely. This is known as periot, the laying bare of the glands. An additional requirement was added at a later period directing that the circumciser apply his lips to the penis in order to draw the blood that flowed from the incision. For hygienic reasons, this practice was modified to allow the blood to be drawn by an absorbent material like cotton. For a baby boy, the circumcision must take place on the eighth day after birth. Unless medical reasons prevent it, only one exception is allowed to the universal requirement that Jewish infant boys be circumcised. If two previous sons have died as a result of the operation, thereby implying hereditary hemophilia, the third and all subsequent sons are exempted from circumcision. The day of circumcision for an infant boy is considered a time of celebration for the entire community. Customarily, the father of the boy hands his son to the circumciser, who recites appropriate prayers and typically invokes Elijah. The ceremony is often followed by a religious meal of celebration. What is the ritual details of circumcision? Circumcision the removal of the foreskin of the penis is performed. On all male Jewish children on the eighth day after their birth. It is also performed on male converts to Judaism. The operation is called for in Genesis 17 and is considered. The strongest required sign of adherence to Judaism. It is also a powerful symbol of the covenant of Abraham. As implied by the Talmudic tractate Netarim 31b. Circumcision was originally performed because the foreskin was considered to be a blemish. To attain a state of perfection, the foreskin had to be removed. During ancient times, some Hellenistic Jews especially those whose loins would be exposed in the course of athletics or public bathing had an operation performed to conceal their circumcisions. Later, in order to prevent Jewish men from hiding their circumcisions, rabbis added the requirement that the entire force can not just the end portion be excised completely. This is known as periot, the laying bare of the glands. An additional requirement was added at a later period directing that the circumciser apply his lips to the penis in order to draw the blood that flowed from the incision. For hygienic reasons, this practice was modified to allow the blood to be drawn by an absorbent material like cotton. For a baby boy, the circumcision must take place on the eighth day after birth. 
unless medical reasons prevent it. Only one exception is allowed to the universal requirement that Jewish infant boys be circumcised. If two previous sons have died as a result of the operation, thereby implying hereditary hemophilia, the third and all subsequent sons are exempted from circumcision. The day of circumcision for an infant boy is considered a time of celebration for the entire community. Customarily, the father of the boy hands his son to the circumciser, who recites appropriate prayers and typically invokes Elijah. The ceremony is often followed by a religious meal of celebration. Is there a Jewish ritual of marriage? Many readers will be familiar with the Jewish custom of having the groom, standing with the bride under a canopy. The huppa, shatter a wine glass with his foot at the conclusion of wedding ceremonies. The symbolic act is meant to help people keep in mind the seriousness of marriage. And perhaps even to recall the destruction of the temple. The whole ceremony is called Kiddushin, the sanctification. Taking place in almost any kind of public space, including a synagogue, it begins with a procession. The ritual is largely up to the couple and their families. Along with the rabbi presiding, and is not dictated by traditional text or established rubrics. A reception typically follows, often with a blessing before and after the meal. Is there a Jewish ritual of marriage? Many readers will be familiar with the Jewish custom of having the groom, standing with the bride under a canopy. The huppa, shatter a wine glass with his foot at the conclusion of wedding ceremonies. The symbolic act is meant to help people keep in mind the seriousness of marriage. And perhaps even to recall the destruction of the temple. The whole ceremony is called Kiddushin, the sanctification. Taking place in almost any kind of public space, including a synagogue, it begins with a procession. The ritual is largely up to the couple and their families. Along with the rabbi presiding, and is not dictated by traditional text or established rubrics. A reception typically follows, often with a blessing before and after the meal.